Apollo Automobili, the reformed manufacturer responsible for the gum pert Apollo has officially revealed its next hypercar. Called the Intensa Emozione, Italian for intense emotion, this next generation hypercar is ready to fight off exclusive, seven figure rivals from Koenig Seg and Pagani. At its center is a bespoke carbon fiber chassis composed from a rigid tub and unique carbon fiber subframes. Much like a LaFerrari, Apollo has integrated the front seats into the chassis, offering the driver adjustment in the pedals and steering wheel. The double wishbone pushrod suspension has been coupled with three-way adjustable Bilstein dampers all round while a set of carbon ceramic Brembo brakes take care of stopping duties. Just behind the driver sits a 6.3-liter naturally aspirated V12 engine. Built by Autotech and ICA Motory, maximum outputs are 769 bhp and 560 pounds foot of torque, relatively subtle outputs compared to some rivals, but with good reason. Apollo says it's a question of ethos, as it isn't chasing record numbers, but wants to offer an intensely emotional driving experience hence the name. The result is a drivetrain that does without turbocharging or hybridization. The V12S9000 RPM redline is a rarity these days, and should yield a responsiveness and an exhaust note that is difficult to replicate otherwise. Connected to the engine is a six-speed sequential gearbox, funneling power to the rear wheels. The IE's biggest draw to some might well be the extreme styling a severe combination of folding, curving, and contouring carbon fiber that does little to hide its aggressive intentions. Massive aerodynamic features cover the bodywork, making the 1,350 kg downforce figure at 186 mph entirely believable. Unlike the Gumpert Apollo, which looked more like a race car for the road, the IE is chock full of slick detailing. Peer inside and the unrestrained styling continues with molded padding making up the seats and dash interlinking with ornate carbon fiber work. The blood red monotone interior might jar with some, but finished in a more subtle grey or black finish, it looks able to challenge even Pagani in terms of design and execution. All this carbon fiber has also facilitated an ultra-low curb weight of 1,250 kg giving the IE a claimed 0 to 62 miles per hour time of 2.7 SEC, but all the arrow limits the top speed to 207 miles per hour prices are set to start at 2.3 million euros, 2.05 million pounds, although Apollo is planning for all 10 vehicles to undergo a substantial personalization program, so it's likely customer cars will be even more expensive by the time their owners take delivery. Apollo Automobili, the reformed manufacturer responsible for the gum pert Apollo has officially revealed its next hypercar. Called the Intensa Emozione, Italian for intense emotion, this next generation hypercar is ready to fight off exclusive, seven-figure rivals from Koenig Seg and Pagani. At its center is a bespoke carbon fiber chassis composed from a rigid tub and unique carbon fiber subframes. Much like a LaFerrari, Apollo has integrated the front seats into the chassis, offering the driver adjustment in the pedals and steering wheel. The double wishbone pushrod suspension has been coupled with three-way adjustable Bilstein dampers all round while a set of carbon ceramic Brembo brakes take care of stopping duties. Just behind the driver sits a 6.3-liter naturally aspirated V12 engine. Built by Autotech and ICA Motory, Maximum outputs are 769 bhp and 560 pounds foot of torque, relatively subtle outputs compared to some rivals, but with good reason. Apollo says it's a question of ethos, as it isn't chasing record numbers, but wants to offer an intensely emotional driving experience hence the name. The result is a drivetrain that does without turbocharging or hybridization. The V12S9000 RPM redline is a rarity these days and should yield a responsiveness and an exhaust note that is difficult to replicate otherwise. Connected to the engine is a six-speed sequential gearbox, funneling power to the rear wheels. The IE's biggest draw to some might well be the extreme styling a severe combination of folding, curving, and contouring carbon fiber that does little to hide its aggressive intentions. Massive aerodynamic features cover the bodywork making the 1,350 kg downforce figure at 186 mph entirely believable. Unlike the Gumpert Apollo, 
which looked more like a race car for the road, the IE is chock full of slick detailing. Peer inside and the unrestrained styling continues with molded padding making up the seats and dash interlinking with ornate carbon fiber work. The blood red monotone interior might jar with some, but finished in a more subtle grey or black finish, it looks able to challenge even Pagani in terms of design and execution. All this carbon fiber has also facilitated an ultra-low curb weight of 1,250 kg, giving the IE a claimed 0 to 62 miles per hour time of 2.7 SEC, but all the arrow limits the top speed to 207 miles per hour prices are set to start at 2.3 million euros, 2.05 million pounds, although Apollo is planning for all 10 vehicles to undergo a substantial personalization program so it's likely customer cars will be even more expensive by the time their owners take delivery. Apollo Automobili, the reformed manufacturer responsible for the gum pert Apollo has officially revealed its next hypercar. Called the Intensa Emozione, Italian for intense emotion, this next generation hypercar is ready to fight off exclusive, seven-figure rivals from Koenig Seg and Pagani. At its center is a bespoke carbon fiber chassis composed from a rigid tub and unique carbon fiber subframes. Much like a LaFerrari, Apollo has integrated the front seats into the chassis, offering the driver adjustment in the pedals and steering wheel. The double wishbone pushrod suspension has been coupled with three-way adjustable Bilstein dampers all round while a set of carbon ceramic Brembo brakes take care of stopping duties. Just behind the driver sits a 6.3-liter naturally aspirated V12 engine. Built by Autotech and ICA Motory, maximum outputs are 769 bhp and 560 pounds foot of torque, relatively subtle outputs compared to some rivals, but with good reason. Apollo says it's a question of ethos, as it isn't chasing record numbers, but wants to offer an intensely emotional driving experience hence the name. The result is a drivetrain that does without turbocharging or hybridization. The V12S9000 RPM redline is a rarity these days, and should yield a responsiveness and an exhaust note that is difficult to replicate otherwise. Connected to the engine is a six-speed sequential gearbox, funneling power to the rear wheels. The IE's biggest draw to some might well be the extreme styling a severe combination of folding, curving, and contouring carbon fiber that does little to hide its aggressive intentions. Massive aerodynamic features cover the bodywork, making the 1,350 kg downforce figure at 186 mph entirely believable. Unlike the Gumpert Apollo, which looked more like a race car for the road, the IE is chock full of slick detailing. Peer inside and the unrestrained styling continues with molded padding making up the seats and dash interlinking with ornate carbon fiber work. The blood red monotone interior might jar with some, but finished in a more subtle grey or black finish, it looks able to challenge even Pagani in terms of design and execution. All this carbon fiber has also facilitated an ultra-low curb weight of 1,250 kg giving the IE a claimed 0 to 62 miles per hour time of 2.7 SEC, but all the arrow limits the top speed to 207 miles per hour prices are set to start at 2.3 million euros, 2.05 million pounds, although Apollo is planning for all 10 vehicles to undergo a substantial personalization program, so it's likely customer cars will be even more expensive by the time their owners take delivery. In order to enter the GTE class of endurance racing, a race car must be based off a production model. Aston Martin just unveiled a brand new Vantage, and it didn't take very long before its racing counterpart emerged from behind the curtain. The Aston Martin Racing Vantage GTE is an endurance race car based off the new 2019 Vantage Coupe. Like its road legal sibling, the Vantage GTE gets its power from a 4.0-liter Mercedes V8. While the company did not explicitly give out power figures, it claims the GTE makes in excess of 536 horsepower and 516 pound-feet of torque, which is more than the standard Vantage. It might look cooler than the regular Vantage, but you're going to have an awful time taking an honest-to-goodness GTE race car on public roads. Aston Martin instead of an 8-speed automatic, 
the Vantage GTE relies on a six-speed sequential racing gearbox and an Alcon multi-plate clutch. Its limited slip differential is mechanical, as opposed to the streetcar's electronic unit. The Vantage GTE also sports adjustable dampers and sway bars, as well as a pneumatic jack system that removes the need for techs to use a separate floor jack during pit stops. Inside, it's much harder to tell that this is based on the Vantage. As it is a race car, the inside is built with the driver, safety, and not much else in mind. There's a steel roll cage, a racing seat with six-point harnesses, fire extinguishers, a Cosworth driver display gauge and an electrically operated water bottle. Out back, a radar system helps keep the driver from contacting faster traffic as it whizzes by. My favorite part of the entire car, though, is the rear diffuser. Motorsport diffusers are a bit more hardcore than your average car's diffuser, and that's pretty damn evident here the thing sticks out for days behind the rear bumper. If you're not paying attention, a walk through the paddock could result in a banged up shin for you and a very expensive repair for the car. The new Vantage GTE will be ready for the beginning of the 2018 season. Aston Martin Racing will retain both Darren Turner and Johnny Adam as drivers, both of whom were class winners in the 2017 24 Hours of Le Mans. It will compete in both the GTE M, Amateur, and GTE Pro, Professional, classes. Aston Martin Vantage GTE will beat competitors with looks alone. Aston Martin has released yet another teaser image of the upcoming Vantage, this time alongside a shadowy silhouette of what is likely to be its racing car relative. We can make this assumption thanks to two details. The first being the enormous rear wing, the other being the race-style side mirrors that look awfully close to the ones employed by the current Vantage GTE Pro model. The GTE Pro car also looks to integrate the same full-width light bar across the rear tailgate. The front aspect car displays a low and wide shape with slim, compact LED headlights and a subtle power bulge on the bonnet. Thanks to the development cars spotted on the road we have a pretty good idea about what to expect when it comes to the overall shape, but the detailing is still almost completely unknown. According to insiders, Aston Martin Chief of Design Marek Reichmann and his team will move the new Vantage further away from its bigger DB11 brother in its new generation adopting a similar sharp-nose style grille from the one-off DB10 scene in the James Bond movie Spectre, combined with a tighter, more compact body. The DB11's contentious floating roof strakes also look to be missing from underneath the camouflaged wrap covering the car in our spy shots, as is the front wheel arch vent. As with the DB11, the new Vantage will benefit from Aston Martin's relationship with Mercedes, the two work together on powertrain development and the latter owns a 5% share in the former, but unlike the V12 it will go beyond the use of infotainment systems and unseen electronic aids and will include AMG's hot V-twin turbocharged 4-liter V8 engine. Sticking with the capacity as used by AMG in the likes of the C and E63, and GT Sport Cars car, the new Vantage is expected to arrive with circa 500 bhp allowing the range to grow with ever more powerful derivatives. AMG already squeezes nigh on 600 bhp from the same engine, which should be plenty for the Vantage S model, while a V12 Vantage is also expected to arrive later in the model's life cycle, along with a Roadster. Later this year Aston Martin will also launch the DB11 V8 in preparation for the arrival of Bentley's new Continental GT. Aston is expected to offer both a manual and auto gearbox with its new Vantage, the former a 6-speed the latter at least an 8-speed and also sourced from AMG. Expect a low 4 SEC 0 to 60 mph time and a 190 mph plus maximum. With the outgoing V8 Vantage currently starting at £94,995 Aston Martin ownership is likely to be a 6-figure buy when the car is available to order later in the year. This is the latest and greatest hypercar Aston Martin has released. It's named the Vulcan, and it's a track-only V12 monster to rival the likes of the McLaren P1 GTR and Ferrari FXXK. The Vulcan made its official debut at the 2015 Geneva Motor Show, and customers are finally taking delivery of their cars which require transporting to various racetracks around the world, as the Vulcan is not road legal.
Only 24 examples of the Vulcan will be built a number inspired by Aston Martin's success in 24-hour endurance racing and each commands an asking price of £1.8 million. Headline news is of course the car's 7.0-litre V12 engine, which contrary to popular trend is naturally aspirated and does without a turbocharger or complex hybrid system. It's tuned to offer over 800 bhp. The short list of cars we'd like to drive flat out at Circuit de la Sarte hosting venue of the LE Mans 24 hours isn't actually that short. But one could do much worse than the latest batch of ultra-exclusive track-only hypercars and of those, the Aston Martin Vulcan has to be among the favorites. There's not a modern racer at LE Mans that sounds quite as right being extended along Hunotiers, the famous Molson Strait, each gear hammering home for another bout of rampant acceleration. Check out the video above to see more. Ivo's Jethro Bovingdon joined Aston Martin factory racer Darren Turner for a ride in the Vulcan back in 2015, an experienced Snetterton racetrack from the passenger seat. Here's what he had to say. I've been in a few GT3 cars and climbing into the Vulcan is a very different experience. It's beautiful. The interior was intended to have the feel of a racer but with the exquisite finish of the 1-77. The gorgeous steering wheel has all the major controls on it like a racer but the design and materials create something that's as much art as function. Today the engine isn't fully unleashed but it feels mighty as we pull out of the pit lane and sweep onto Snetterton. The Vulcan is a big, wide car and it feels it at the first tight hairpin, the tail slipping sideways and the traction control cutting in as Turner makes a swift correction. But once up and running into the faster turns the aerodynamic grip starts to take hold and the car seems absolutely nailed to whatever line he chooses. It's a spooky feeling as the car tips in and your brain is convinced you're about to disappear into a gravel trap only for it to turn with no drama and then thunder out onto the next straight. The brakes feel superb too, hanging me on the four-point harnesses with a tireless ferocity. Turner completes a handful of laps each one slightly faster than the last but well within the Vulcan's comfort zone. I suspected this might be a bit scary but actually I'm smiling, and sometimes hooting with laughter, and just enjoying the noise, the acceleration, and the massive lateral GS that this extraordinary machine serves up. Early days or not the Vulcan is already a spectacular machine to experience and I'm sure the 24 guys and girls lucky enough to be buying one will love it to death. Aston Martin Vulcan technical highlights breaking even further with track car tradition, the Vulcan's engine is front-mounted, rather than the mid-engined layout in its McLaren and Ferrari rivals. It sits inside a carbon fiber tub, which is crafted using the same mold as the one from the 1-77. It sends its power to the rear wheels via an Strac 6-speed sequential gearbox. The Vulcan also gets a limited slip differential and magnesium torque tube with a carbon propeller shaft. Brakes are carbon ceramic discs 380mm at the front and 360mm at the back. F1 style pushrod suspension is further aided by adjustable dampers, and the whole thing rides on unique 19-inch Michelin tires. Adjustable anti-roll bars and variable traction control offer a tailored level of driver assistance. Weight has been kept to just 1,350 kg 150 kg less than the 1-77 with which it shares its structure. The Vulcan is designed to meet full FIA race specifications, meaning it's eligible to compete in several race series worldwide. Designer Marek Reichmann says it could even be a full GT3 car with some simple modifications, but in current form would qualify for some races like Bathurst. Engineering firm RML is heading in the other direction, and says that the Vulcan can be converted to road legal status with just a few adaptations. Lighting needs to be changed, and safety and emissions testing also needs to be carried out, but the end result could be the most convincing road-going racer around. ATS Automobili has officially returned to the Supercar Club with the new GT. The car was revealed at Salon Prive earlier in in 2017 but now the drivetrain, performance and pricing information have been announced. The ATS GT starts at €1,150,000, or a tad over £1 million at current rates, ATS will only build 12 units, each specified to the taste of their respective owners. Inside. 
the supercar is filled with solid aluminium switchgear and bespoke Alcantara trim to help justify the jaw-dropping price tag. Under the rear deck sits a 3.8-liter, twin-turbocharged V8 engine connected to a 7-speed dual-clutch gearbox. The ATS will produce 650 bhp in standard trim, although it is also available with an optional power upgrade taking that figure closer to 700 bhp. If you're thinking that this Italian supercar has an Anglo whiff to it, you wouldn't be far wrong, as the wheelbase, suspension and standard power output all mimic that of a McLaren 650s. Regardless of whether the GT is indeed based on McLaren components, performance should be brisk to say the least. Although it is still in the process of completing final specifications, ATS says the GT should be able to hit 62 miles per hour in around 3 seconds and will be capable of a top speed of over 200 miles per hour. Built to emulate its 1963 predecessor, also named GT, the new GT will be underpinned by a handmade carbon fiber rich chassis, keeping dry weight at 1,300 kg. The GT is styled by Emmanuel Bomboy, formerly of Fiat and later design director of Bertone and ATS says it offers a timeless yet striking design, evoking the brand's past while reflecting its very contemporary performance. Although it is hard to see the resemblance to the 1963 car, the new GT takes on many contemporary supercar design cues, including a low front scuttle and highlighted accent line running along the side of the glass house. ATS Automobili itself has quite the interesting heritage. A byproduct of turbulent times at Ferrari in the early 1960s, the brand was born when internal personal battles drove a subset of designers and engineers, including Carlo Kitty and Giotto Bizzarini, out from Prancing Horses Stable. They eventually reformed themselves into ATS Automobili. Launched in 1963, the GT and Motorsport Biased GTS were the brand's first cars. Both were technologically advanced for their time but a commercial flop with only 12 produced in total between 1963 and 1965. The engineering prowess brought to ATS by these former Ferrari innovators was evident in the original GT though. The car is able to claim the title of the first mid-engined Italian supercar an honor usually thought to be associated with the Lamborghini Miura that appeared three years later. If you wanted your current Audi R8 sans roof the only state of tune offered in V10 Spider guys was a mere 533 bhp. We know, shocking. How were we meant to sleep at night? Audi has been quick to rectify this, and at the 2017 Goodwood Festival of Speed it announced it was to turn the wick up on its V10 and offer its R8 Spider in plus spec as it does with the coupe which means 603 bhp and 413 pounds foot of torque. Now you can sleep easy. Engine, transmission, and 0 to 60 miles per hour time 5.2 liters, 10 cylinders, 7 speeds, 4 wheel drive, 0 to 62 miles per hour in 3.3 sec and a top speed of 203 miles per hour, the R8 Spider V10 Plus wants for very little in the numbers department. Audi's dry sump V10 engine in plus spec is an intoxicating mix of vocal brilliance and violent performance. Large capacity lungs give it the tractable low down drive ability so many crave and are accustomed to from today's crop of turbocharged engines, while the 8700 RPM redline provides a quite remarkable top end with genuine reach and athleticism. By today's standards the R8S 7-speed dual-clutch S-tronic transmission may appear to be a ratio or too short compared against some rivals, but it's matched perfectly to the engine's power and torque characteristics, shuffling through the ratios without a hint of interference. Naturally it wants to climb up to the highest ratio as soon as possible in order to meet its faux emission targets, but the combination of its speed and willingness to change gear on its own accord with a sharp immediacy, combined with the V10S traction and low-end grunt means it's rare for you to have to step in and flick a paddle to find the right gear. Which is handy, because they are disappointing in terms of size, too small, and action, too switch-like, and hopefully Audi Sport will be putting an order in with cousin Lamborghini to procure the paddles used in the Hurricane Performance sooner rather than later. There's nothing disappointing about the V10 Plus Spider's performance, however.
a near 3 second 0 to 62 miles per hour time and a 203 miles per hour maximum are serious numbers, especially so when you consider an R8 with no roof weighs 1695 kgs, the fabric roof weighs 44 kgs. Give it the full potatoes in the first three gears and you'll need more than Mr. Loophole to keep you from a stint at Her Majesty's pleasure. Do the same in the following three gears and you'll want to hope the local constabulary's helicopter hasn't been cleared for takeoff. For all of Audi's bad behavior and blatant cheating when it comes to Dieselgate you have to stand back and admire this V10 masterpiece, involving, thrilling, intoxicating, and as destructive as a fox in a chicken coop, now if only McLaren could find its way to building a naturally aspirated motor. Currently the R8 Spider V10 Plus is only available with Audi's Quattro four-wheel drive system, we expect a rear-wheel drive example to join to the recently announced R8 RWS to arrive at some point in 2018. As with the R8 V10 Plus Coupe, a mechanical limited slip differential is fitted as standard. Technical highlights carbon fiber brakes and lightweight forged alloy wheels are standard on the new R8 Spider V10 Plus, and where the coupe has a fixed rear spoiler the Spider has a smaller, more discreet carbon lip spoiler. The rear diffuser has also been tweaked to assist in reducing lift and producing as much as 100 kg of downforce at maximum speed. Lightweight bucket seats are also standard in this top-line Spider derivative and if you desire you can also have the car's side blade produced in carbon fiber. Virtual cockpit is standard, those bucket seats can be switched for more comfort-orientated chairs and there's a host of colors and trim available, too. Built on Audi's lightweight aluminium space frame, the R8 Spider V10 Plus benefits from the construction techniques used in the regular R8 Spider which means a combination of aluminium and carbon fiber at its core and the stiffest possible chassis. Audi's Drive Select system is standard, allowing you to select either predetermined settings comfort, auto, or dynamic for the engine, gearbox, suspension, steering, differential and exhaust note or you can pick and mix as you please in individual mode. What's it like to drive? It's impossible to ignore, so we'll start with the V10. Roof up or down there is no escaping its thunderous soundtrack. Stick with the former and you can drop the small rear screen over your shoulder to allow the noise in while keeping the wind out. And what a noise. It has everything we adore about large capacity, naturally aspirated engines. Revs become addictive, full throttle escapes from junctions and out of corners a must. Get the front wheels hooked up. Manage the slightest amount of push and squeeze the throttle as the lock unwinds and you'll be pulling gears quicker than film ceremonies pulling Harvey Weinstein's invitation. Being a 603 bhp supercar we've taken the liberty of presuming you'll want the engine's throttle response in its sharpest setting, to do so sets the V10 up to be nothing but electrifying in its response to the slightest throttle opening. Yes. You can short shift and surf that torque but you'll be missing out on electric top end that you sense would rev until the valve gear fired itself through the carbon engine cover if it could. Criticisms? The pops, crackles, and artillery fire from the exhaust in dynamic mode are far too much and far too furious. So to the riotous startup procedure, which won't earn you any favors with the neighbors if you're an early starter. And the seating position which in our test car with the regular seats and not the racing buckets, was pretty poor. To accommodate the folding roof the rear bulkhead has moved forward, the result being you can't get the seat base far enough back, nor the back of the seat to recline enough. Our long-term test R8 Spider, non-plus, fitted with optional bucket seats was a far better, if still not perfect combination. Dynamically there's scant trade-off compared to the coupe. On poor UK roads the steering column will rumble in your palms more so than it does in an aluminium roofed equivalent, and if you catch a poor surface or a lump in the road with the chassis under serious load you'll catch the faintest of wobbles through the body. It's not as rigid as the carbon tub of McLaren's 570s at the limit, but it's much steadier, more controlled and sure-footed than AMG's GTC Roadster or Ferrari's 488 Spider. The R8 V10 Plus Spider has few vices. Its damping manages the ride with clarity, rarely phased unless presented with a damaged surface and flows with precision and reassurance. The carbon ceramic brakes shed serious speed with serious intent, 
the nose is quick to turn and even with dynamic steering you can place the R8S nose with precision. Audi still has some work to do with its dynamic steering setup, though. While you no longer have to take continuous bites and nibbles through every corner, there remains a remoteness on initial turn-in and you feel the messages you are getting back from the front axle are delayed and less than clear as to what's going on. At times you feel you're on top of it all, flowing from turn-in to apex to exit, and then nothing. For a split second the communication channel is closed before immediately reopening. But in that time the smallest amount of doubt has crept in. Step over the limit and the diff locks up quickly and cleanly and a roll of the wrists will apply the required lock to hold, then allow you to drive through the transition. Out of tighter turns you can work the quattro drive train to your advantage and get on the power sooner than you think and drive out of a corner with more throttle much earlier, with the front tires guiding you out as the rears take all the torque they can and a little bit more while you add some counter steer. For a wide, heavy, Four-wheel drive car the R8 V10 Plus Spider can be unexpectedly agile. Prices and rivals at £145,315 the R8 V10 Plus Spider crashes a very busy party. McLaren's new 570s Spider is the host with its carbon tub, exquisite steering and a chassis that even Ferrari's 488 Spider from the class above can't match. AMG's GTC Roadster is a different take on a two-seater Roadster being a more thuggish and perhaps a little more one-dimensional but no less exciting, whereas Aston Martin's new DB11 V8 Volante will need to be prepared to get amongst it if it's to challenge this burgeoning sector. And, of course, there's the 911 Turbo S Cabriolet, not our first choice 911 nor our fourth but its pace and composure cross-country can never be ignored. Where once roadsters, spiders, and spiders, and volantes were seen as the poor relation in the driver's car pecking order they have more than come of age and you'll need to work hard to find one that falls flat on its face and in this esteemed company the R8 Spider V10 Plus holds its head high. The original Audi RS5 debuted in 2010 and was arguably the brand's best attempt yet to recapture the magic of its legendary Ur Quattro. Featuring a similar four-seat coupe body, flared wheel arches and four-wheel drive, it ticked all the right boxes. And while it lacked the original's five-cylinder soundtrack, it compensated with its howling V8. In fact, this naturally aspirated 4.2-liter eight-cylinder unit was the dynamic highlight. The rest of the car just failed to live up to the promise of its raw ingredients. It was fast and composed but it lacked the driver involvement that marked out the best, such as the BMW M4. Audi RS5 vs BMW M4 vs Mercedes AMG C63S, Suprudist review however, there's now an all-new Audi RS5 that's been developed to address the old version's shortcomings. Lighter, faster and powered by a powerful new twin-turbocharged V6, it promises to be one of the firm's most engaging and entertaining machines yet. At least that's what Audi claims. Before you even so much as open the driver's door Audi is keen to point out that the RS5 has been designed to cover a wider brief than its immediate rivals. In fact, bosses stress that this is a high-performance GT car that can be transformed into razor-sharp sports coupe as and when the mood takes. Audi RS5 in detail performance and 0 to 60 time. The RS5 edges out the competition in a launch style start covering 0 to 62 miles per hour in 3.9 SEC and is capable of delimited 174 miles per hour top speed. Engine and gearbox, the 2.9 liter, twin turbocharged V6 develops 444 bhp, but the gains have been made in the mid range courtesy of 442 pounds foot of torque available from 1900 rpm. Ride and handling, the new RS5 has progressed significantly over the old model, lighter, more focused and hugely capable, although it still feels a bit inert alongside rivals. MPG and running costs, the smaller blown engine makes the RS5 more efficient than its predecessor, with Audi claiming 32.5 MPG on a combined cycle. Interior and tech, the RS5 does justice to Audi's reputation of producing class-leading interiors crammed with an endless list of tech functions. Design, 
a collection of tasteful exterior tweaks imbue the RS5 with the necessary aggression to wear the RS badge. Audi RS5 vs Rivals, Evo 240 saw the Audi RS5 meet the M4 competition pack and Mercedes AMG C63 in an Evo Su Prudist. Prices and specs Image 1 of 33 Image 1 of 33 The Audi RS5 weighs in at £62,900, which means it undercuts natural rivals such as the BMW M4 Competition Pack, £64,010, and Mercedes-AMG C63, £63,475. It matches the competition for kit, too, with satin AV, lead headlamps, and Napa leather seat trim. Yet it's still possible to go overboard with options and splash out on items such as 20-speaker Bang and Olufsen Hi-Fi, a carbon fiber exterior styling pack and a driver pack that raises the top speed to 174 miles per hour. BMW's M4 has been refreshed and the new Audi RS5 does the numbers to put the Frighteners on a full-blown supercar, but can either see off the Mercedes-AMG C63S? Over 3,000 miles on road and track the Avosu Prudist provided the answer. The new RS5 is 60 kg lighter with a 444 bhp twin turbocharged 2.9 liter V6 in the nose replacing the old V8. It's mated to an 8-speed automatic gearbox and a faster reacting four-wheel drive system. The M4 has the 3,000 pounds competition package which adds 1.9 bhp to the familiar blown straight 6 for an RS5 equaling 444 bhp and also brings stiffened and lowered suspension, thicker anti-roll bars, adaptive dampers, and an additional front splitter. The Mercedes-AMG C63S is the most powerful of the lot, harboring a 4-liter twin-turbo V8 with headline figures of 503 bhp and 516 pounds foot that leave the Audi and BMW looking a little undernourished. This is shaping up to be a bruising encounter. The plan is for this Suprudist is fairly simple on paper, but it promises to be grueling in practice. First we'll hit the road for a two-day tour of some of the most testing tarmac Yorkshire has to offer, then we'll visit Millbrook Proving Ground to run performance figures, before finally heading to Bedford Autodrome for some timed laps of the quick and challenging West Circuit. You can pick up Evo 240 for the full drive story and get our individual verdicts on each car by reading our reviews but below we're bringing you the edited highlights as RS5, M4 and C63 duke it out over a 3000 mile examination. Audi RS5 vs BMW M4 vs Mercedes AMG C63 S Suprudist click the links below to jump to the Suprudist data and track test sections, then get the final verdict. 250 horsepower isn't a lot in the modern autosphere, but it feels like plenty when directed through the rear tires of a car as simple and slender as a Mazda MX-5. Particularly as Northamptonshire seems to be auditioning for the first leg of the Volvo Ocean Race and farm vehicles have left a thin sheen of various brown substances on the county's B-roads. The MX-5 in question is Brackley-based BBR GDI's first turbocharged take on the fourth-generation model following naturally aspirated packages for the 1.5 and 2-liter cars. The conversion is based on the larger-engined MX-5 and centers around a twin-scroll hybrid turbo, a bespoke exhaust manifold and a stainless steel downpipe. Gases are cooled by a front-mounted aluminium intercooler, while other modifications include stainless steel oil and water lines, custom silicone turbo pipes, a KNN high-flow induction kit and Starship ECU tech software. BBR describes it as a Stage 1 turbo package, and the result is 248 bhp at 7150 rpm and 236 pounds foot from 3250 rpm increases of 90 bhp and 89 pounds foot over Mazda's claims for the standard car. BBR also quotes a 0 to 60 miles per hour time of 5.0 SEC, against 7.3 SEC to 62 miles per hour for the unmodified car and a 155 miles per hour limited top speed, up from 133 miles per hour. As we've come to expect from BBR, everything looks like it was assembled in the factory at Hiroshima, with only a custom carbon fiber turbocharger heat shield hinting that something might be out of the ordinary under the bonnet. Externally BBR's demonstrator also wears a Mazda body styling kit, 
BBR branded stripes and ounce ultra legra alloy wheels with Yokohama tires, which collectively exude a level of menace not present in a showroom fresh MX-5. You'll pay more for touches like these, but everything required to lift the MX-5 to the advertised output will set you back £5,274 if you intend to fit it yourself, or £5,994 if you want BBR to do it for you. Cleverly, the car doesn't feel transformed when you first thumb the starter button and fire up the boosted Skyactiv 4-pot. Only the bassy note of this car's BBR Super Sport exhaust gives the game away, but the idle settles down to normal levels and prodding the standard clutch feels no different from doing so in any other MX-5. If you're not familiar with the regular car, you probably won't notice the first subtle difference, either. With intake and exhaust gases now taking a slightly longer, more convoluted path, throttle response isn't quite as sharp as usual, so exploratory blips of the pedal take a little longer to elicit movements on the rev counter. Until you pass 3000 RPM, that is. That's the point at which BBR's car diverges from the regular MX-5, gathering pace with increasing intensity and commotion towards the red line. The engine now offers its best between 3000 and 6000 RPM, with the same linearity and drivability of the standard car garnished with an audible whoosh and considerably greater forward momentum. Combined with a firmer suspension setup, that newfound output requires circumspection on wet, greasy roads. Mazda's standard traction control just about copes in a straight line, but around corners you'll spend plenty of time correcting amusing but rapid spikes of oversteer even before the stability control intervenes. You can turn it off, of course but you'd best bring your car control a game if you do so. That's not to besmirch BBR's conversion, because it's very well judged indeed. It's a perfect option for a used MK4 MX-5, though even added to a brand new one, priced from £21,595, meaning a total of £27,589, it looks pretty reasonable given you'll have enough power to close the performance gap to almost any modern hot hatch but in a smaller, lighter, more attractive, more involving and more entertainingly rear-driven package. As part of our 1500th issue celebrations, we decided to take a look at the best used cars that can be found on the second-hand market for £1,500 or less. A great performer needn't cost an arm and a leg, and below we've rounded up five top buys that will serve you well on a tight budget. For example, did you know that virtually any MK6 Ford Fiesta can be bought for under £1,500? That includes a low-mileage model from 2004, originally priced at £9,845, that we found meeting our £1,500 mark. Buying a used car, all you need to know we also discovered a MK2 Mazda MX-5 with 80,000 miles on the clock for a very reasonable £1,295, proving that a fun drive can be secured for relatively little outlay. Better still, the MK2 MX-5 is yet to reach classic status, so prices are still broadly cheap. There are a few things to watch out for of course. When looking for your £1,500 car, Remember to check for telltale signs of aging such as rust or poor maintenance, which might suggest that a car hasn't been properly looked after. Whether you're after practicality or a thrill, the list below has a suggestion to get the ball rolling en route to a £1,500 bargain. And with such a small price to pay, you'll be laughing all the way home. Scroll down to read about our favorite £1,500 cars or alternatively check out these other price brackets. Best used cars in other price brackets Ford Fiesta Image 2 of 6 Image 2 of 6 we found, 1.25 LX5 DR, 2004-04 Reg, 5 2K miles, price new, £9,845 price now, £1,500 engine, 1.25 liter 4 CYL, 75 BHP economy, 45.6 mpg CO2 slash tax, 148 g slash km slash pound 150 euro NCAP, 4 stars, 2002, 
since it first appeared in dealers in 1976 the Fiesta has almost continuously been Britain's best-selling car, which is why there are hundreds of them available second-hand for up to £1,500. As a result, you can choose something newer and with a higher mileage, or older and more sporty. You'll have to spend more than £1,500 to get a MK7 Fiesta the one that's just gone out of production and was first seen in 2008 but you've got your pick of MK6 editions at this price point. You can have a Fiesta with three doors or five, petrol or diesel power, and a manual or automatic gearbox. By maxing out our budget we could buy a one-owner car that's averaged just 4,000 miles each year since 2004. Equipped with Ford's suite. Free revving 1.25 liter petrol engine, the car should give another 100,000 miles, while LX trim brings aircon, a heated windscreen, remote central locking, and electric adjustment for the mirrors and windows. Skoda Octavia Image 3 of 6 Image 3 of 6 We Found, 2.0 TDI PD Elegance Estate, 2005 05 Reg, 87k miles, price new. £15,600 price now, £1,495 engine, 2.0 litre 4 CYL, 138 bhp economy, 47.9 mpg CO2 slash tax, 159 g slash km slash pound 190 euro NCAP, 4 stars, 2004, the Octavia has historically done very well in our driver power surveys notching up numerous first places thanks to its blend of talents that include fine practicality, reliability, comfort, and value. It's an ideal family car that we're happy to recommend. Your £1,500 budget will buy an early high-mileage second-generation diesel Octavia or a lower-mileage petrol edition, or you can have your pick of first-generation models, up to 2004. Most cars in this budget are hatchbacks but the estate version will stow 1,620 litres compared with the hatch's 1,350 litres. The flagship model has climate and cruise control, rear parking sensors, alloys, plus electric windows front and rear. We'd expect it to give at least another 100,000 miles with no more than routine servicing. BMW 5 Series Image 4 of 6 Image 4 of 6 we found, 520 ISE Auto. 2002 slash 52 reg 103k miles price new 23360 pounds price now 1495 pounds engine 2.2 liter 6 cyl 170 bhp economy 31.4 mpg co2 slash tax 216 g slash km slash pound 305 euro ncap 4 stars 1998 Arguably one of the most complete family saloons ever made, the BMW 5 Series is sublime to drive, spacious, superbly built and can be very well equipped, too, if you track down a car with a few choice options. Our search threw up an array of petrol and diesel models, almost all of them fourth generation versions, including numerous 520DS and 530DS, along with a V8 powered third generation, E34. 540i. Diesels have usually done far more miles than an equivalent petrol, which is why we've chosen this relatively low mileage 520i. For under £1,500 you get an auto box, full leather trim, powered windows and mirrors, plus a smooth 2.2 liter six-cylinder engine that's got tens of thousands of miles of use left in it. Mazda MX-5 Image 5 of 6 Image 5 of 6 we found. MX5 1.8, 2003 slash 03 reg, 80k miles, price new, 15,495 pounds price now, 1,295 pounds engine, 1 1.8 liter 4 CYL, 146 bhp economy, 32.5 mpg CO2 slash tax, 210g slash km slash pound 305 euro NCAP, 4 stars. 2002, proving that you don't need a lot of power to have fun, the MX-5 is a sheer delight that's also reliable, easy to drive and incredible value. Really good MK-1s have started to go up in value, but the MK-2 is currently in that twilight zone where it's not yet a classic, 
so for £1,500 you can buy an excellent example. However, there's a crash structure in the MK2S nose that rots from the inside out, and if this needs to be repaired it costs at least £600 so pre-purchase checks are essential to avoid an unwanted bill. Mazda offered 1.6 or 1.8 liter versions of the MX-5 MK2, the latter coming in standard and higher spec sport versions. Sport added electric windows and mirrors plus alloys and a limited slip diff over the entry level car's spec. While the model we found isn't being sold as such, it appears to be a sport, which is the one to go for. Honda CRV Image 6 of 6 Image 6 of 6 we found, 2.0 IVTEC Executive. 2004 slash 04 reg 85k miles price new 18600 pounds price now 1500 pounds engine 2.0 liter 4 cyl 138 bhp economy 42.2 mpg co2 slash tax 177 g slash km slash pound 240 euro ncap four stars 2002 the problem with a lot of mid-sized SUVs is that they have either front-wheel drive or full-time four-wheel drive, but Honda's MK2 CRV came with part-time four-wheel drive. As a result, you get the efficiency offered by power going to the front wheels only, plus grip through all four wheels when you need it, making the CRV an ideal tow car. If you're buying to tow, you're better off tracking down a diesel-engined model, but you'll have to pay at least £1,700 and ideally a bit more. Stick with our £1,500 budget and you can secure a top-of-the-range petrol CRV with satellite navigation, a sunroof, leather upholstery, heated front seats and climate control, and just 85,000 miles on the clock. Whatever you buy, check that the aircon works and that the differentials haven't worn out, the latter is given away by pronounced whining when cruising. Celebrating 1,500 issues of Auto Express the best 1.5 liter cars from past and present best cars for 1,500 pounds or less best car upgrades, the full car makeover for 1,500 pounds opinion, they told me AE wouldn't last 15 issues, never mind 1,500 opinion, here's to the next 1,500 issues and a diverse future. Passing your driving test and buying your first car, is for many, a step on the ladder of becoming a fully-fledged adult. You really have your freedom when you can walk outside, get in the car and drive anywhere you like, provided your budget can stretch to some fuel. Saying that, the first cars listed below are not solely for newly qualified teens, they are an excellent choice for all types drivers new or experienced. Mostly because they are all cheap to buy, cheap to insure cheap to run, rammed with safety kit, simple to maneuver and not too powerful. The reason we favored inexpensive cars, is because paying for lessons often puts cash at a premium, and moving from your instructor's Vauxhall Corsa to something significantly larger can be difficult. All of the models below offer rock-bottom buying and running costs to make sure they are realistic goals for new drivers. Best super minis to buy now similarly, as insurance which you are required by law to have, is the biggest outlay for many when buying a first car, we have made sure that each model named is in one of the lowest insurance groups. To help keep your insurance premiums down, many brokers fit black boxes to monitor your car use and driving style. Such policies are a surefire way to reduce your expenditure and are worth considering. Cheapest cars to insure when you are looking at new cars, you may be attracted by free insurance deals, but while these will cut your costs, there will usually be age restrictions, usually age 21 and older. If you're eligible, it's a great way to build up your first 12 months of no claims discount, and you'll be surprised by how much your insurance costs will drop after the first year. If you're a parent who is helping your child to get on the road by buying their first car, then you'll want a car that's safe. It's worth looking at a car's Euro NCAP crash test results but bear in mind that cars tested after 2015 faced a tougher regime, so you can't directly compare ratings between models. However, any new car is going to be a safe place when compared to an older used model. 
Do check that Electronic Stability Control ESC, is included in a car's kit list, too, as it can sometimes be optional on the very cheapest cars. Best city cars to buy now diesel cars have attractively high fuel economy figures, but a diesel can underperform and become unreliable if you don't use it on long distance runs regularly. If you're just going to use your car for trips to the shops, a petrol car is a better option. In reality, petrol cars will be more than economical enough. When you're inexperienced behind the wheel, it's important that a car gives you confidence. Look for a car with light steering and a tight turning circle, while large windows will help you see where you want to go and what's around you. Thankfully, these days small cars can be upgraded with options such as parking sensors which and SAT NAV, which will help you concentrate on driving. Most young drivers will want a decent stereo, while gadgets such as Bluetooth and a USB connection can be had on these entry-level models, so you can keep connected and help you. This is BMW's first M4, the result of a convoluted new naming strategy it has employed across its model range, but be in no illusion that in the saloon-based performance coupe sphere, BMW doesn't only know how to play the game, it pretty much created it. So when BMW launched the M4 back in 2014, its mixed reception didn't so much come as a surprise, but rather bewilderment about what could have possibly gone wrong. Since then, the M4, and its four-door M3 sibling, has undergone multiple revisions, as well as been diversified into the excellent, but eye-wateringly expensive CS and lesser competition pack options. Equipped with the same 3-liter twin-turbocharged straight-six from its initial launch, the M4S speed has never been in doubt, but has BMW been able to reintegrate the finesse which helped define its illustrious forebears? There is no quick way to describe how the M4 drives suffice to say it could never be described as dull or benign. The M4S complicated reception has not only been affected by its reputation either, because where previous M3S largely had their corner of the market to themselves, the M4 most certainly doesn't, with the charismatic Mercedes AMG C63, Alfa Romeo Giulia QV and Audi RS5 all raising their game for class honors. So does the M4 still deserve its place at the top of its mount, or has the king been dethroned? Read on to find out. BMW M4 in detail performance and 0 to 60 time, the M4 matches the performance of supercars from not long ago, hitting 62 miles per hour in 4.1 SEC and reaching 155 miles per hour. The most impressive figure, however, is a 0 to 100 miles per hour time of 8.6 SEC. Engine and gearbox, the 3 liter, twin turbocharged straight 6 develops 4 to 5 bhp, but the real drama comes from the new engine's torque which peaks at 406 pounds foot from just 1850 rpm. Ride and handling, the new M4 is lighter than the coupe it replaces and as a result feels more alert and agile. However, the steering is now electrically, not hydraulically, assisted, so some feel has been lost. MPG and running costs, now with a turbocharged engine, the M4 is substantially more frugal than before and BMW quotes a combined 34.4 mpg. Interior and tech, the M4S relative age comes through in the interior, but quality and tech can't be argued with. Design, the M4 stands out from the regular 4 series with a power dome bonnet, swollen wheel arches, deep air intakes and, the now obligatory for an M car, quad tailpipes. Video review See the M4 pitted against an M5 then a Porsche 911 Carrera. Watch our BMW M4 video review here prices, specs and rivals the M4 costs £59,080 for the coupe and goes up to £63,180 for the convertible. Both can be optioned with a wide array of kit that will easily drive the car over the £70,000 mark. Carbon ceramic brakes for example add £6,250 while adaptive LED headlights cost £1,200. The competition package adds another £3,000 over the standard car. However, the manual gearbox is standard. 
The only reason you'd choose the less than ideal DCT gearbox is because you've been advised, possibly wrongly, that it will help the car's residual value. Opting for the paddle shift transmission will cost you £2,695. The M4 CS now replaces the more extreme GTS as the range topping special, costing from £89,130. Although not a limited build model like the GTS, the CS will not be built in large numbers. The CS does without water injection, a factory roll cage or an adjustable rear wing too, instead it has been designed to sharpen up the standard M4S dynamic capabilities without resorting to levels that would make it a chore to drive every day. The price and performance of the M4 put it squarely in line with the likes of the new C63 AMG, Audi RS5 and the Lexus RCF arguably, the M4 is a different ownership proposition to all of them, being a more raw and hard-edged car. But these M cars lack some of the drama that their rivals offer. Plenty of track testing with the M4 reveal that the carbon ceramic brakes are fantastic but perhaps not an option worth ticking unless you intend on driving the M4 frequently on track. In pure specs terms however, the M4S standard offering perhaps bests its rivals. iDrive remains one of the best in-car entertainment systems you can get, while the special M Sport seats are nice to look at and fantastically supportive and comfortable. Alpha hasn't pulled any punches with its new Julia. The Quadrifoglio comes with a carbon fiber prop shaft, torque vectoring, adaptive dampers, a carbon fiber bonnet and front splitter, as well as optional carbon ceramic brakes. The Alfa Romeo's interior looks special, even if it doesn't feel very premium. There are several touches clearly lifted out of the Ferrari rule book, including big aluminium shift paddles and an engine start button on the wheel. To drive, the Giulia feels progressive and engaging while the engine remains exciting right the way to its 7000 RPM redline. It also puts out a sound that's easily on PAR with the M4, but not quite a match for the C63S turbocharged V8. Downsizing and turbocharging are old hat now, but back in 2011 they were still the cause of much soul-searching especially when the outgoing model was powered by a race-bred 5-liter naturally aspirated V10. Somehow a 4.4-liter V8, even one with twin turbos, didn't have quite the same cachet. Most perturbing of all, the engine note would be supplemented by synthesized sounds from the hi-fi. On the other hand, the V8 in the new, 73,040 pounds F10 M5 did have one or two things in its favor. A peak power figure of 552 bhp overshadowed even the V10E60S fabulous 500 bhp, making the new model the most powerful road car BMW had yet built. In terms of torque, the V10 was simply monstered. Where the old unit made its 384 pounds foot at 6100 rpm, the new one had 501 pounds foot all the way from 1500 to 5750 rpm delivered in near-seamless fashion thanks to a dual-clutch gearbox in place of the previous automated single-clutch manual. The performance figures 0 to 62 miles per hour in 4.4 SEC and a restricted top speed of 155 miles per hour, or 190 miles per hour with the optional M driver's package told only part of the story. On the road, and despite weighing a massive 1,870 kilograms, 115 kilograms more than the E60, the new car was effortlessly, breathtakingly, dizzyingly rapid. There was even more power if you spec the 6,700 pounds competition package, introduced for the 2014 model year alongside a minor facelift and interior revamp. The pack lifted peak power by 1.5 bhp to 5.67 bhp, cutting the 0 to 62 time to 4.2 SEC. It also included a louder exhaust, a tauter chassis and a drivetrain recalibrated for sharper responses. Even a regular F10M had a hugely impressive armory of hardware and software to manage its prodigious outputs, with a new electronically controlled active M differential, multiple modes for damping, steering and throttle, and not one but two M buttons on the steering wheel to call up your preferred combinations. In 2015, 
BMW launched the limited edition 30R M5 to mark the 30th birthday of the M5. It was essentially a competition package with another 25 bhp, lifting the total to 592 bhp and trimming the 0 to 62 miles per hour time to 3.9 SEC. Just 30 were brought to the UK, all in striking, matte finish frozen dark silver, with a list price of £91,980. The same mechanical spec was used for the Swan Song Competition Edition, launched in 2016 with a run of just 200, laden with extra M goodies and priced at £100,995. But then even a regular M5 could be specced close to £100,000. Temptingly, one of these magnificent machines could today be yours for as little as £30,000. Here's how to find a good one. Specs Engine V8, 4,395 cubic centimeters, twin turbo max power 552 bhp at 6,000 7,000 rpm max torque 501 pounds foot at 1,500 5750 rpm transmission 7 speed DCT, rear wheel drive. Active M differential weight 1870 kg power to weight 300 bhp slash ton 0 to 62 miles per hour 4.4 SEC, claimed, top speed 155 miles per hour, limited, 190 miles per hour option, price new 73,040 pounds, 2011, checkpoints engine and transmission the S63 twin turbo V8 didn't get off to the best of starts with a number suffering oil pump failures leading to severe engine damage. Around 700 minutes and 5 seconds an SIXS built between July and September 2012, including 19 UK cars, were recalled and the defective parts replaced. Happily, the recall nipped the problem in the bud, and the engine is since proving extremely reliable, observes Munich legend Stuart Draper. The one issue we do occasionally see is high oil consumption, says Stuart. I'd say it affects around 1 in 10 cars, usually where the first owner didn't stick to the running in guidelines and drove it harder than they should over the first few hundred miles. Cars seem to fall into two camps. Most use no oil or very little oil, but in the worst cases they can use a liter every 500 miles. So look for the usual clues, blue smoke specks of oil on the rear bumper, an oil container in the boot. We've seen occasional problems with injectors and airflow meters, which can be expensive if the car's not under warranty, says Stuart, but generally it's a good, robust engine. Same goes for the transmission, which is proving incredibly hard-wearing. We've seen no selection issues. Servicing intervals are variable, depending on usage. The S63 uses timing chains, so there are no belts to replace, but the third service is the biggie, as it includes transmission fluid, spark plugs and other pricey items. Suspension, steering and brakes no serious issues to worry about here. The F10 chassis was so stiff that the drivetrain and suspension could be pretty much solid bushed says Stuart Draper. Consequently they don't have as many wear and tear issues as earlier cars. The brakes are a big improvement on those of most earlier M cars, with proper discs and six-pot calipers. Very few buyers went for the carbon ceramics. Today anyone looking for an upgrade for track days tends to go for a Brembo setup. To replace a set of front discs and pads is about £1,300, and it's a similar sum for the rears, which actually wear at least as fast because they're used by the traction control. In fact the brakes seem to wear extremely well, usually lasting 30,000 miles or more, says Stuart. A few owners prefer the right and lower road noise on 1.9-ion wheels, but the vast majority of original buyers went for the 2.0-ion option. Check their condition carefully, including on the inside of the rims. Tires seem to last surprisingly well, with some owners even reporting getting 20,000 plus miles from the rears. Budget around £250 per corner if the tread is marginal. Body, interior, and electronics no serious issues here. Do check that the air conditioning works as it should F10S were subject to recalls for aircon failures. Some cars suffer slight but irritating rattles from around the B-pillars and door trims, 
which can take time to trace and rectify. Prices Parts Prices from MunichLegends.co.uk Tire Price from BlackCircles.com All prices include VAT but exclude fitting charges and are correct at the time of publishing. Tires, each, £252.42 front, £266.90 rear, Michelin Pilot Super Sport, front pads £478.99, set, including sensors, front discs £852, pair, damper £869.33, single, air filter £33.06, per bank, Oil filter £23.75 Spark plugs £194.11 Set, servicing prices from MunichLegends.co.uk, including VAT. Servicing is condition based with variable intervals and are correct at the time of publishing. Minor service £418.09 Major service £954.32 Brabus has revealed performance upgraded packages for the Mercedes AMG S63 4MATIC and Mercedes Maybach S650 models. First up is the, the Brabus B40 700 Power Extra package, which is available for the S63 S. This upgrade boosts power and torque for the twin turbocharged 4.0 liter V8 to 691 bhp and 701 LB Ford respectively. The standard model delivers 603 bhp and 664 pounds foot. The upgrades are largely down to a software rewrite for the engine management system, which includes revised injection and ignition maps, and a recalibration of the electronic boost pressure control. The 0 to 62 miles per hour sprint takes 3.3 SEC, a whole second faster than the standard car while top speed is raised to a claimed 186 miles per hour. If these Porsche 911 GT2Rs rivaling figures leave you unmoved then Brabus can sell you the 217 miles per hour Brabus 900. Based on the luxurious Mercedes Maybach S650 it features a comprehensively reworked V12 that has boosted power to a heady 888 bhp and torque has swelled almost 50 per center to 1106 pounds foot coming on stream at 5500 rpm and 4200 rpm respectively. The rear drive layout prevents the 900 from launching as cleanly as the four-wheel drive B40-700, meaning the 0 to 62 miles per hour dash takes 3.7 SEC. Brabus has worked much harder to achieve the performance increases on the 900. For starters, the 6-liter engine has been stroked and bored out to 6.3 liters, while a custom, machined crankshaft has been fitted, too. A new intake system incorporating a redesigned radiator and new air filter box supply air to the new turbos, which house bigger compressor and turbine elements. A stainless steel exhaust system and brand new, bespoke exhaust manifolds help the V12 breath as freely as possible to best harness the benefits of the uprated turbos. Both cars wear aerodynamic, carbon fiber bodywork additions which have been honed through wind tunnel testing to deliver functional aero gains. The lightweight add-on also offer the pair a distinct visual upgrade over the cars they are based on. Inside, the familiar opulence of the flagship Mercedes saloon remains, the only real change is a unique reprofiled Brabus center console. There's also the choice between quilted leather or Alcantara interior and wood or carbon inlays as well. Brabus hasn't yet released pricing for these two models, but it has revealed that both will be covered by a comprehensive 3-year and 62,000-mile warranty. Remember the Mercedes SLR McLaren? It was one of the first occasions where the line between GT and modern hypercar was blurred. The Aston Martin 1-77 on first impressions, appears to share a similar philosophy. That is until you drive it. It may have a set of GT car proportions. Note the long-reaching bonnet and rear-set cabin, but be in no doubt that the ultra-rare Aston Martin 1-77 is as highly strung and intense as any mid-engined hypercar. This amazing car is the star in this installment of Evo's Car Pictures of the Week, which features some unseen images of one of our most iconic features. But let's backpedal, forgetting about the mesmerizing technical makeup for the moment. 
The 1-77, as an object, was unlike almost anything else on sale at the time. We had seen plenty of hypercars built in the hundreds, and sold for hundreds of thousands, but 1-77 was built to operate on a different level. A total of 77 units were constructed and each sold for seven-figure sums. For a, relatively, mainstream company, this type of project was a real test of the power the Aston Martin brand could wield at the very top of the market. It wouldn't have been enough just to produce something of exceptional quality, thankfully Aston Martin did not disappoint. The 1-77 utilized a bespoke carbon chassis wrapped in hand-finished aluminium panels. One iconic element was the carbon fiber engine brace. It was not only a structural component to improve stiffness across the front axle, but it also acted as an intake plenum. The powertrain was made up by a 7.3-liter V12, loosely based on Aston's existing 5.9-liter unit, but significantly redesigned and built by Cosworth. The engine could also sit a massive 100 mm lower in the chassis, despite its rise in capacity, mainly thanks to a new dry sump oil system. Connected to this via a carbon fiber prop shaft was a six-speed single-clutch automated manual gearbox. Despite Aston Martin's persistent efforts to stop journalists having a go, one very generous owner gave us the chance to experience what Aston Martin gives you for £1.15 million. Don't forget to download your free HD EVA wallpaper by clicking on the image below and click here to download a bespoke smartphone optimized wallpaper. Cars with cool in-car tech under $25,000 at this point, in-car tech options like Android Auto and Apple CarPlay are becoming household names. If you're buying a new or lightly used car, these are must-have features. But there are many other in-car technology features worth considering. Today's new car shopper can opt for in-car Wi-Fi, forward collision warning, emergency braking, HD radio, name brand audio systems and even simple things like push-button start. Of course, many mid to high priced cars have these features sometimes their standard equipment. But what if you are looking to spend as little as possible? You might be surprised at some of the cool features you can get for a below average price. With that in mind, here are 10 new cars that cost less than $25,000 but still have some pretty cool tech. For most people, the arrival of a 60th birthday is usually a sign that it's time to slow down a little. Maybe even consider retirement. However, after six decades on sale, the Caterham 7 has no intention of kicking back. Three score years on from its debut as the Colin Chapman penned Lotus 7, this lithe and lightweight machine is still setting the standard for drivers seeking hardwired driving fun. And it shows no sign of settling for the pipe and slippers just yet, with ever faster versions and technical innovations keeping it fresher than its 1950s styling cues would have you believe. In an age of autonomous vehicles, the Caterham remains an ever-present reminder of the joys of being in total command of a car. This is driving in its rawest and most rewarding form. So what better way to celebrate this remarkable car's success than with a road trip that takes in landmark locations that have played an integral part in the history of this resilient machine? And what better cars to choose than the models that bookend Caterham's range today the entry-level 160 and the deranged 620R? The former is the embodiment of the 1957 original, with its focus on lightness, simplicity and affordability while the latter is a vivid demonstration of just how far the 7 concept can be stretched. Both are widely different in their approach, and price, yet each is spun off the same underpinnings, which have been carefully and constantly evolved over the decades. We're sure you might have heard about the Chevrolet Corvette ZR1 by now. Numerous camouflaged prototypes and a leaked image have all been circulating around the internet for months now but will we Brits be missing out on anything when it eventually goes on sale in its native US? The Corvette is already available in a suite of pretty tasty forms, the meanest currently being the Z06. Packing 650bhp, aside from some reliability issues that plagued early cars, the Z06 is widely considered to be one of the best American sports cars. Period. So where will this ZR1 fit in? Examining prototypes, 
the most obvious modification over current Corvettes is the massive GT3 style wing and its corresponding aero modifications. As is common with the most extreme Immersion sports cars, the ZR1S front and rear bumpers are bluff and blistered. Massive cooling intakes punctuate the front fascia, while jutting out underneath is a huge splitter, no doubt balancing out that rear wing. The rear quarter panels are the wider units from the Z062, while the front wings feature larger slit vents and reprofiled wheel arches to accommodate a wider front footprint. Spied here in cabriolet form, the ZL1 will also be available as a coupe, and with both automatic and manual transmissions. Only barely hiding underneath the car's bulging bonnet, the 6.2-liter supercharged V8 engine is expected to be the same basic unit as in the Z06, only with the wick turned up. Rumors suggest a figure of around 750 bhp, 100 bhp up on the Z06 matched with requisite upgrades to the cooling, the cause of the Z06's initial reliability woes. Like the ZR1 Corvettes that have come before, this will be a swan song model for the current generation of Corvette, which has been on sale since 2013. An all-new Corvette is well into its development cycle and it will move the classic small block V8 behind the driver making it the first ever mid-engined Corvette. Some may lament the change in engineering philosophy, but GM's engineers have said that the move has come about due to having reached what they consider to be the limits of front-engined capability. Despite there having been seven generations of Corvette in the current front-engine rear-drive combination, it's likely that this final ZR1 might be the most extreme and capable front-engine Corvette ever. Chevrolet has confirmed the reveal date of November the 12th so we won't have to wait long to get the final details. Lamborghini dispatched a heavily camouflaged Urus to the desert to demonstrate one of the model's three off-road driving modes. The Urus, the world's first super SUV, according to Lamborghini, is being unveiled on December 4 with a price near £180,000. As the Urus takes to the dunes in the video, the driver is seen selecting Sabia, Sand, on the rocker switch which recalibrates various parameters of the anima, adaptive network intelligent management, governing engine mapping, suspension and traction management systems to suit the terrain. The anima switch allows the driver to toggle between six driving modes. The top three, Strata, Sport and Corsa are found on all current Lamborghinis, whereas the bottom trio are all new off-road modes, Sabia, Terra and Neve which translate as sand land and snow respectively. Lamborghini's commitment to producing an SUV marks the changing times and demands of the market even Ferrari is going build an SUV of sorts according to reports. To keep the Urus on brand, Lamborghini will endow it with serious performance. A 4-liter twin-turbo V8 will drive through a dual-clutch transmission directing over 600 bhp to all corners. Interestingly the Urus will sit on the same basic platform as the Porsche Cayenne extremely capable itself in turbo guys, so how Lamborghini differentiates and develops the driving experience should be interesting. One way will be through the implementation of Lamborghini's four-wheel steering system, seen in the Aventador S, which aids agility and handling. Lamborghini is looking to muscle in once again on the competitive high-performance SUV segment. The Porsche Cayenne Turbo Audi SQ7 and Bentley Bentayga are all rivals from within the VW Group stable, although the Urus is expected to be priced closet to the latter. The BMW X6M and Mercedes AMG GLE 63 S4 MATIC Coupe offer impressive performance and take similar off-road coupe forms to the Urus, although they will undercut the Lamborghini by a significant sum. Lamborghini won't be chasing massive sales volumes with the Urus straight away. Company boss Stefano Domenicoli told Auto Express, We need to be humble. We need to start step by step because it's a new world for us. He continued however by saying that the Urus could account for more than half of Lamborghini's global sales by 2019. Whether you like the idea of a Lamborghini SUV or not, it should be good news for petrol heads. The capital produced by a big volume seller will hopefully fund the continued and greater investment in the company's line of supercars and hypercars. This is the same route Porsche took with the KN, and it's proved to be one of the German company's biggest success stories. 
Those with an eye on the history books will remember that this isn't actually Lamborghini's first SUV. Back in the late 80s, the brand experimented by producing the LM002 the result of a project to produce a military vehicle. It used the V12 engine from the Countach, and offered the most luxurious interior Lamborghini had ever put in a car but a combination of sky-high running costs and challenging styling meant it was consigned to the history books by 1993. Lamborghini bosses will be hoping for a rather more successful outcome from the Urus. Thursday, Italian race car chassis constructor Dallara announced it will build its first road car, which it will christen Straddle, the Italian word for road. The term has long been used by the likes of Ferrari, Maserati and Lancia to denote homologation or road legal variations of race cars. Thus, the Straddle name carries connotations and will have to live up to the expectations of other cars given the label. Gian Paolo Dallara, the company's founder, states that he believes the car would meet the standards of his idol, the legendary Colin Chapman, whose philosophy of simplify, and add lightness revolutionized Formula One. I like to think that Colin Chapman, who I started to admire since the time of his Lotus 7, would approve the essence and simplicity of this car, said Dallara in the company's press release. In this project, there is everything we learned from racing and collaborating with our customers, and I'm convinced that whoever uses this car will be able to taste the taste of travel, the desire to ride in the car for a nice ride, the pleasure of driving sick. Dallara the car was designed as a speedster, but can be turned into a roadster with the addition of a windshield, or ordered as a gull-winged coupe. A rear wing, allowing the car to make up to 1,808 pounds, 820 kilograms, of downforce, is optional for those who intend to use as primarily on track, as is adjustable suspension, and customers can choose between a six-speed manual transmission or paddle shifting. Advertised curb weight is 1,885 pounds, 855 kg, and the combination of this minuscule weight figure, highly developed suspension geometry, and immense downforce permits lateral G acceleration of 2 gs. For reference, Road and Track reports the final Dodge Viper ACR skid pad results at around 1.5 gs. Power is produced by a supercharged 2.3 liter inline 4, a Ford EcoBoost unit according to Autocar. Tuned to 400 horsepower, its power is reined in by a suite of Bosch electronic assists, such as traction and stability control. This gives the Dallara Straddle a power-to-weight ratio of 424 HP per ton, putting it even with the updated first generation of the Audi R8 supercar. The price sits at $182,384, $155,000. And production is a set number of no more than 600, with the car's entire first year of production already claimed by eager customers. Dallara Dallara's current motorsport chops include IndyCar's DW12 chassis, which has been standard since 2012, and Haas F1 team's VF17. Though the DW12 has been phased out after the end of the 2017 season in favor of a new chassis that will rely more upon floor downforce, Allowing for closer racing, Dallara's finger is firmly planted in the pie of the replacement's development. The company was also responsible for the manufacture, but not design, of the Haas VF17 Formula One car, driven in this year's season by Romain Grosjean and Kevin Magnussen. The VF17 stands eighth in the World Constructors' Championship, two points adrift of Renault Sports R.S.17 which the team may yet overtake to finish 7th in the championship after the upcoming Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. Ferrari has given the Le Ferrari-based FXXK track-only supercar a few tweaks in the aero and weight departments, following a similar upgrade format to that applied to its previous FXX and 599 FXX models. Called FXXK EVO, this latest XX Ferrari is arguably the most extreme customer car to ever roll out of the factory. Ferrari says the upgrades have been focused around a reduction in weight and an increase in downforce, the former achieved through further refinement of the carbon fiber manufacturing process. Taking inspiration from its Formula One racing team, 
Ferrari has not mentioned any specific figures in regards to the weight loss. This weight reduction is made even more impressive by the fact the FXXK EVO also features additional aerodynamic components like a new fixed rear wing, a rear clamshell mounted central fin and canards fitted to the front bumper. Producing 640 kg of downforce at 124 mph, the EVO package represents an increase of 23% compared to the standard FXXK and 75% on the LE Ferrari road car. The new fixed biplane rear wing, extending the full distance between the normal car's rear prongs, brings about the bulk of this improvement. After over a year's testing and refinement in simulations and the wind tunnel, downforce produced is comparable to that of a GT3 or GTE racer. Changes to the front and rear bumpers also contribute to these improvements, with both the front and rear aspects being subtly redesigned to support the more dramatic front splitter and rear diffuser. Mechanically, the hybrid-assisted V12 is unchanged from the one in the FXXK, still producing 1020 bhp and upwards of 664 pounds foot of torque. Available in an extremely limited production run or as an upgrade package for existing FXXK owners, the price is likely to be the EVO pack's most irrelevant fact for potential buyers. The Design Museum in London has just opened the doors to a new exhibition celebrating the meticulous and glamorous world of Ferrari. Featuring over £140 million worth of historical road and racing Ferraris alongside memorabilia like original engineering drawings, styling bucks, and even Enzo Ferrari's driving license, the show is a must-see for fans of the brand and its heritage. Celebrating the Italian mark's 70 years of creative development, the exhibition begins at the company's origins in northern Italy amongst a backdrop of post-war austerity. Meandering through the initial parts of the exhibition, visitors are presented with technical drawings and engineering mock-ups of Enzo Ferrari's early racing cars. One particular favorite is a section drawing of the famous Colombo V12 engine, a core engine utilized in Ferrari road cars right up to the 412i of the late 1980s. Continue through the exhibition and a full-sized clay model of the Ferrari J50 Commission sits at the center of the room, but look around and you can't help but spot the delicate aluminium chassis of a 250 GTO straining to steal your attention. A full-sized wooden styling buck, made by coach builder Scaglietti for low production racing variants of the Dino, also features, as do two modern wind tunnel scale models from Ferrari's more recent past. Further in the exhibition you'll be greeted by racing cars once driven by legends like Sir Sterling Moss and Michael Schumacher, along with the technology developed by Ferrari that went on to revolutionize motor racing. One example is the 7-speed paddle shift gearbox, which Ferrari was first to fit in a Formula One car back in 1989. This single piece of technology has since not only spread throughout motor racing, but across the automotive industry as a whole. It neatly puts into context the important part Ferrari has played in the development of road and racing cars. The exhibition finishes with Ferrari's latest hypercar, the LE Ferrari Aperta situated next to a video installation discussing the future of the car industry and Ferrari's role within it. With 70 years of passion, innovation, and excitement behind it, Ferrari's next 70 years will likely take the brand into brave new arenas. Whether you are a fan of Ferrari, a general car enthusiast or even just interested in the role Ferrari has played in the advancement of design and engineering, Ferrari, under the skin is a brilliant snapshot of the illustrious Italian mark. Romans International is selling a Bugatti Chiron on behalf of its owner, who's set to net a seven-figure profit if the car sells for its £3.6 million asking price. Having covered just 1,330 miles in his 2.5 million pounds hypercar, the owner has decided to list his Chiron, the first to hit the second-hand market in the UK. The idea of parting with your Chiron to make a quick buck may be alien to many enthusiasts, but not so to all when such significant financial gain is possible. The invisible hand of demand and supply has pushed Chiron values well beyond the retail price with only 500 units expected to be built in the next 10 years. This owner is looking to ride the appreciation curve for a huge return near £1 million. 
it's little wonder the Chiron has accrued such a significant premium. Tom J. Connelly, director of Romans International, said, although the Chiron is not yet sold out, if you place an order today you will be waiting at least three or four years before the car could be built and delivered, so we are offering the chance to jump the queue but of course there is a hefty premium to pay for this privilege. The quoted extras on this example equate to £73,000, the price of an option-laden BMW M4 competition package, comprising the leather and carbon fiber interior and carbon fiber sports seats. The first owner also opted for the factory-applied full paint protection film to preserve the pristine nocturne black finish. Despite the prospect of an ownership change the car will retain the manufacturer issue warranty, valid through until 2021. The fast Ford formula is alive and well in the Focus ST, everyday usability meets serious performance at an affordable price. Replacing the notoriously thirsty 5-cylinder 2.5-liter turbo motor of its predecessor with a smaller 2.0-liter, 4-cylinder EcoBoost engine hasn't just improved economy and emissions, on paper, at least, but given performance a useful shot in the arm as well. And in this facelift car, those strengths still remain. There's an entertaining chassis beneath the ST, with eager steering and good balance. But it's also a car that some may quickly tire of, with no LSD to tame the 247 bhp the ST puts to its front wheels, and a nose that seems to react to every camber and rut in the road. Driving the ST quickly then can be hard work on bumpy UK roads, not helped by a very firm ride. However, it's hard to ignore the ST's value with more than enough performance to take the fight to the Volkswagen Golf GDI and Vauxhall Astra VXR, the appealing option of an estate version, something denied to most other hot hatchback buyers, and an amusingly throaty induction note thanks to Ford's clever acoustics work. If you can put up with the torque steer and the slightly ropa cabin design, it's a compelling performance option. Ford Focus ST in detail performance and 0-60 to 60 time, with 2.5 bhp more power than its predecessor, the Focus ST sprints to 62 miles per hour in 6.5 SEC, matching the Volkswagen Golf GDI. Read more about the Focus ST's performance here. Engine and gearbox: the new 2-liter turbocharged engine develops 247 bhp at 5500 rpm. That's complemented by a healthy 265 pounds foot of torque at just 2000 rpm. Read more about the Focus SD's engine and gearbox here. Ride and handling, the facelift Focus car gets electric power steering to sharpen its responses. It's let down by an unyielding ride and significant torque steer and tram lining. Read more about the Focus SD's ride and handling here. MPG and running costs, expect 2530 MPG in the real world from the petrol model, and 45-50 MPG from the STTDCI. Read more about the Focus SD's MPG and running costs here. Interior and tech, the interior is brazenly sporting, with Recaro seats and carbon fiber trim. Ford offers a driver assistance pack that adds collision avoidance and lane keep assist. Read more about the Focus SD's interior here. Design, Ford's facelift has tightened the Focus's lines and done away with excess visual weight. Read more about the Focus SD's design here. Price, specs, and rivals diesel power represents the cheapest avenue into Ford Focus ST ownership, at a tad under £26,000, although the petrol model is only slightly more expensive. Despite the Focus ST's competitive price tag, it isn't found wanting in terms of standard kit. Dual zone climate control, automatic headlights, and wipers and racy recaros comprise the entry level ST2 trim. Upgrade to ST3 specification and the seats are both heated and adjustable and you'll also gain by Xenon headlights and Ford's SYNC3 infotainment system. The estate version creates an extra 160 liters worth of cargo space and adds 1,100 pounds to the price. Pitching the ST estate against the Volkswagen GTD equivalent turned out unsurprising results. Neither were free of flaws but the ST traded the VW's refinement for a more involved and tactile experience. We chose the ST, but the conservative styling and comparatively premium feel of the German Load Lugger will appeal to plenty of people who are cross-shopping the pair. 
The Gulf's premium position informs its higher price, almost £29,000, about £1,000 more than the top spec ST3 Focus ST estate. The Skoda Octavia VRS provides another competitor out of the VW Group stable offering both diesel and petrol. Unlike the Golf GTD, with which it shares its diesel engine in TDI form, all-wheel drive is available, exclusively mated to the automatic transmission. It's our hot diesel estate pick. There's plenty of petrol-powered hot hatchback to rival the ST Peugeot's 308 GDI 270 by Peugeot Sport has a sweet, zingy turbo for lending it true appeal and, of course, the Volkswagen GDI still remains the segment yardstick although quite pricey with the basic car starting near £28,000. The Hyundai i30N is arguably the biggest threat to the ST. We've been nothing short of astounded by it. Prices start just below £25,000 for the lower-powered version pushing out the same 247bhp as the ST with the i30N performance carrying a £3,000 premium matching the Focus ST3, patch, price. Benefiting from more power, sticker rubber, and an electronic limited slip differential the i30N performance is not only more compelling on paper but better to drive, too. Forget Bugatti, Koenigsegg Agera becomes fastest car in the world Koenigsegg Agera has just smashed the world record for the fastest car in the world setting a new top speed in the Agera, sending warning shots to both Bugatti Chiron and Hennessy Venom F5. Over the past few weeks the hypercar giants have been tussling for attention. Firstly the Bugatti Chiron claimed a world record for a test they invented in the Chiron by going from 0-249-0 mph in just 42 seconds. Koenigsegg came to spoil Bugatti's party just weeks later with the Agera Rs, taking just 36.44 seconds to achieve the same test. Hennessy, not wanting to feel left out announced the new Venom F5 which it claims could travel in excess of 300 miles per hour. Bugatti and Hennessy are both taking their flagship vehicles, Chiron and Venom F5, out next year to have a go at the world record for the top speed. Ahead of that however, Koenigsegg has sent a strong message to both car companies over the weekend with the Agera Rs. On a closed stretch of the Nevada highway the Agera Rs hit 285 miles per hour. WTH an average speed of 277.9 miles per hour after the two-way average was taken. Previously the world record was held by the Bugatti Veyron Super Sport which clocked 269.86 miles per hour in 2010. Driving the car was Nicholas Lelia, who claimed the 0-249-0 mph record from Bugatti a few weeks ago. The factory spec Agera Rs he was driving has a 5.0-liter twin-turbo V8 engine which produces 1,360 bhp, 1,011 pounds foot of torque. The battle for hypercar supremacy is definitely hotting up and with the Chiron and the Venom F5 still to test, it'll be interesting to see Koenigsegg can hold on to this record. The first model to be built by Gordon Murray Automotive has been detailed at the One Formula exhibition, also celebrating 50 years of Gordon Murray car design. To be sold under the IGM brand, the new supercar will encompass remarkable attention to detail, says Murray, and integrate his iStream manufacturing techniques. Murray intends, in time, to build a variety of products, both of the in-house variety and those commissioned from outside the company. However, the first car to appear will be a flagship car model, apparently returning to the principles that were applied to the iconic McLaren F1. The new supercar will focus on lightweight construction, utilizing the latest iStream carbon fiber techniques combined with high-strength aluminium sections instead of traditional steel. GMA says that the combination of materials has reduced the body in weight weight of around 50 percenter compared to traditional steel stamping. The new supercar will also feature the most advanced aerodynamics yet seen on a production car according to its makers. The car will be manufactured at a new facility at Dunsfold Park, housing both the manufacturing facilities and an R&D center. As for Gordon Murray Automotive, the company will focus on utilizing the iStream manufacturing process Murray has been perfecting for the past 10 years. Every iStream car will have a lightweight ethos 
utilizing carbon fiber construction techniques and taking life cycle analysis into consideration. Gran Turismo is 20 years old this year, which seems like an appropriate time for one of the most important games in the series so far, GT Sport, to make its debut. GT Sport is not like other Gran Turismo games. Well, in some ways, anyway, and if you've not previously been a fan of Gran Turismo, then GT Sport is similar enough in many ways that it's unlikely to change your mind. GT Sport introduction never before has Gran Turismo been focused so much on online racing, and so little on the amassment of weird and wonderful vehicles and completing hundreds of different single-player events. The non-canonical title, GT Sport rather than Gran Turismo 7, as the next full title will be, is the first clue to this. The second is the relative lack of early game content, with just a handful of arcade mode races, license test events and similar practice style tasks to teach you the basics of the game. You can, of course, look through the in-game dealerships, but you won't be buying a used vehicle this time around, and the car list is heavily weighted towards race cars, rather than road vehicles. That initial free zone of excitement from having 10,000 credits with which to buy your first vehicle? Gone, the game gifts you a car simply for booting it up, and your opening balance is 50,000 credits. Both money and other vehicles are much easier to come by than they were in the early days of previous GT games. Work at the license tests, achieving gold in every one, and you'll already have a large amount of money and a handful high-end cars at your disposal by the end. After four or five hours of play and no more than about 200 in-game miles, we'd collected around 15 cars without spending a penny, and had more than 1 million credits to our name. For some players at least, this will be a good thing, quickly glossing over the aspect that some considered a bit of a grind, buy cheap car, enter race, win a little money, tune it up, and repeat, with the quickest cars still well out of reach after days of play but seasoned Gran Turismo players might feel a little shortchanged at the removal of one of GT's unique selling points. Gran Turismo Sport gameplay Thankfully, the gameplay goes some way to making up for it. First, the graphics are beautiful, and everything runs at breakneck speed. Sound design is a big step forward from previous games, and while the road cars can still sound a little thin at times, the race cars finally have the anger and intensity you'd expect of them with gear whine, whip crack gear shifts, and bellicose exhaust notes replicated to an impressive degree. And the handling is the best yet in a GT game, striking the right balance between realism and accessibility. Novices should be able to navigate most tracks unscathed and there are plenty of driving aids to help out, but more experienced players, having turned off all the assists, will quickly identify the fiery temperaments of some vehicles and have to keep on top of tire slip and weight transfer. Cars behave much as you'd expect from their real-life counterparts, and the same applies whether you're driving merely briskly, or dancing over the limits of grip, or indeed, sailing way beyond those limits on some of GT Sports rally courses, which can be a lot of fun. Play the game with a wheel and pedals set up, as we do, a Logitech G29 and the fun and interaction ramps up further. A wheel and pedals should give you the best hope when competing online, too. We're yet to delve into the online aspect that makes up the bulk of GT Sport, so expect more on that soon, including the official FIA-sanctioned events, but the game's creators promise a matching system to put you among drivers of similar experience, and measures to reduce the potential for dirty drivers to infiltrate online lobbies. For the time being, we're excited to dip deeper into what GT Sport has to offer, but conclude this first look review with the caveat that those expecting a deep single-player experience probably won't get the greatest value from GT Sport. Hennessy Venom F5 Launch How to Watch 300PH Car Unveiling Hennessy is set to launch the new Venom F5 Hypercar today at the Speciality Equipment Market Show, SEMA, in Las Vegas. Here is how you can watch the new Bugatti Chiron rival unveiling. Hennessy is lining up to launch the highly anticipated Venom F5 today. 
the new hypercar is aiming to claim the fastest car in the world title, pipping the Bugatti Chiron to top spot. It will be unveiled at the Speciality Equipment Market Show, SEMA, in Las Vegas today. The American Tuning House has already revealed a 600 BHP twin-turbo Ford Raptor at the Vegas show. Aside from the hefty engine upgrade, Hennessy Raptor also gets new suspension and six new 20-inch wheels and off-road tires as well as new front and rear bumper, roll bar, and LED lights. Impressive as this monstrous pickup is, it is the Venom F5 that everyone is interested in after it has been teased for a number of weeks. Ever since the company revealed an image with the new car next to a sign saying speed limit 300 mph, there have been acclaims that this new car could be the first to have a massive top speed. The car was named after an F5 tornado which has wind speeds of in between 261-318 mph suggesting that the car's top speed will be within this bracket. On its website it says that the car will produce more than 1,451 bhp and have a top speed that exceeds 290 mph. Hennessy typically tune fast cars to make them even faster but with the Venom F5 the company has set up a new division to manufacture the vehicle from scratch. The division, called Hennessy Special Vehicles, will develop the new car and build it in Texas. Currently the Bugatti Veyron Super Sport World Record Edition holds the official world record for the fastest car at 258 miles per hour. Hennessy's first supercar the Venom, which produces 1,244 bhp, managed to hit 270.49 miles per hour on NASA's Kennedy Space Center. This top speed was not applicable for the Guinness World Record as to attain the record the run needs to be achieved twice in opposite directions. If you want to watch the live stream for the unveiling of the Venom F5 you can visit the company's YouTube, Facebook and Instagram channels. The live stream will start at 11 a.m. Pacific time which means it'll be live in the UK at 6 p.m. GMT. This dinky little contraption is a Honda N1, a Japanese K-car designed for life in one of the world's most congested cities. K-cars launched in Japan back in the 1940s as a way of getting the country mobile on the cheap, following World War II. The idea quickly caught on, and K-cars today account for almost a third of the country's new car sales. Unless you live in Japan, these types of vehicles are almost impossible to get your hands on so are we being deprived of a quirky city runabout? Best City Cars 2017 If there's any K car that will meet demanding European tastes it's the Honda N1. Kit out with a reversing camera, hill start assist, touchscreen sat NAV and a raft of safety kit, you can think of it as the Mercedes S class of the K car world. Image 2 of 11 Image 2 of 11 Visually there's no denying its cutesy image and odd proportions will win favor with style-conscious European buyers, but inside it falls rather short of matching rivals such as the VW Up. For style, space, quality, technology, or practicality. The list goes on. Find yourself in the back and there's more head and legroom than you'd initially think possible, you really can fit four adults in it relatively comfortably. That space, however has come at the expense of boot capacity there's room for a briefcase at a push. It's powered by a 660 cubic centimeters three-cylinder turbocharged engine, which kicks out just 5.4 bhp and 1.04 nm of torque. That doesn't sound like much, but in a car that weighs around 800 kilograms it certainly feels enough. Pin the throttle and the N1 scampers off the line, accompanied by the enthusiastic thrum of the three-cylinder engine. Power is sent to the front wheels, four-wheel drive models are also available, via a CVT automatic gearbox. That means any attempt to pick up the pace on the move sees the revs soar dramatically, with the wheezy engine struggling to turn that into any sort of momentum. Having said that, hitting speeds above 30 miles per hour in Tokyo is a rare experience. Image 6 of 11 Image 6 of 11 however, it's in cities like this that K cars come into their own. Their tiny dimensions allow you to nip your way through dawdling traffic, slipping past ignorant taxi drivers and squeezing between crowded buses. Nothing else gets you across a city like a K-car does expect a motorbike, or indeed, the subway. Ride quality is decent enough, but the steering is vague and light. 
At low speeds it's not so troublesome but on the expressway and on faster sweeping roads it's a bit of a guessing game as to how much lock you have to apply to the steering to reach your desired direction. Given its flaws and compromises you'd expect that to be reflected in the price tag. But the N1 will set you back around 1.8 m yen in Japan, which equates to about 11,000 pounds. While some companies have nailed their flag to the battery electric mast, others, including Toyota, Hyundai, General Motors, GM, and Honda, are putting more faith in fuel cells for the future of automotive energy. The latter pair have been collaborating on the technology since 2013, and have now announced the automotive industry's first manufacturing joint venture to produce hydrogen fuel cells for production cars. The joint venture should significantly cut costs for both manufacturers in a technology that few companies are pursuing with any real zeal. With battery technology improving all the time, and of more relevance across the technological world, given its applications in consumer electronics, it's so far taken the lead in the race to search for alternative powertrains. Honda and GM's work so far has focused on developing next-generation hydrogen fuel cells and hydrogen storage technologies helping improve the technology and bring down costs through economies of scale. The new fuel cell system manufacturing, FCSM, joint venture will continue that development while also producing fuel cells themselves for use in future vehicles from both companies. So far, Honda is one of few manufacturers to put a fuel cell vehicle into volume production, in the shape of the Honda Clarity. Honda's offering covers 366 miles on a tank of hydrogen and offers petrol equivalent economy of 68 mpg, despite being quite a large and heavy vehicle. Toyota currently offers a production hydrogen car too in the shape of the Mirai, on sale in the UK, while Hyundai produced an iX35 FCEV crossover for a time. Ostensibly, fuel cell vehicles are electric vehicles, but rather than storing energy generated by an external source, in the form of electricity, chemically stored in a battery, the fuel cell uses hydrogen to generate the energy needed for electric propulsion. In theory, it's the ideal setup, with the same benefits of electric vehicles, zero local emissions, instant electric torque, silence, energy efficiency, yet offering higher range and quicker, more conventional refueling times. There are negatives too, however. A hydrogen infrastructure is currently virtually non-existent and expensive to set up, and current methods of producing hydrogen are energy-intensive, or derived from fossil fuel production, negating any potential environmental benefits. In future, the aim is to power the hydrogen-producing electrolysis process through renewable means such as wind power, solar, or biomass, and it's a process that could even be done locally reducing the need for transportation of the hydrogen fuel in the same way current fossil fuels are transported from rig to refinery to filling station. Mass production of fuel cell systems is expected to begin by around 2020, according to Honda. The two companies are making equal investments totaling $85 million, and the joint venture is expected to create nearly 100 new jobs. Conceived by Hyundai's new N division, which is itself led by one Albert Bierman who masterminded most of BMW's best M cars for 20 years until Hyundai poached him in 2014, the i30N is without doubt one of the more intriguing high-performance hatchbacks of the moment. It costs £27,995 and is, says Hyundai, a fully committed effort to take on the likes of the Honda Civic Type R and the forthcoming Renault Sport Megane Rs. Even so, and despite the undeniable credibility of its chief engineer and Hyundai's very obvious desire to persuade us all that it really has crafted a proper driver's car out of the i30, you do wonder. You can't help but wonder. Especially since Mr. Bierman himself admits to not knowing a great deal about front-wheel drive cars before making his move to Hyundai. All it takes, though is one good drive across one great road in the Hyundai i30 and to banish such doubts. Skepticism is replaced by a mixture of mild disbelief, major respect and, most of all, a refreshing wave of pure pleasure about what Hyundai has created in the i30N. Which is to say, 
a thumping good hot hatchback, one that can absolutely stand comparison with the best. Engine, transmission, 0 to 60 miles per hour time on paper the i30N is not a rule breaker in any specific area. Instead, it nudges towards the top of its division right the way across the board, with a 2-liter turbo engine that produces 271 bhp and 260 pounds foot of torque, with 279 pounds foot available on overboost for 18 SEC. As such it can hit 62 miles per hour in 6.1 SEC and has a top speed of 155 miles per hour, all decent enough stats but nothing outrageous compared with the likes of the Civic Type R. The gearbox is a six-speed manual that also features an auto-blipping function on downshifts, and in practice it works a treat. And to drive, well, the i30N is a whole lot more committed than you'd expect from a humble Hyundai. Technical highlights There are several reasons why. 1. It has a proper e-diff that works out all sorts of clever things to keep the front tires keyed into the road at all times. 2. Its chassis has been endlessly developed by Biermann and his team to deliver maximum precision in its most aggressive settings which you'd expect given his background but also a surprising range of comfort and refinement when you dial it all back down via the various electronic drive modes. 3. It rides on a set of bespoke Pirelli P0 tires that were developed specifically for the i30N, and this always makes a big difference to the end result, even if it is an expensive route to take for the manufacturer. The i30N isn't quite a money no object car for Hyundai, but it hasn't exactly been constrained by budgetary concerns either. 4. It has some very trick electronic dampers at each corner that enable it to do things that many other rivals can't even contemplate. And 5. It sounds the absolute nuts if you press the N button on the steering wheel, give it full beans in third gear and then back away from the throttle momentarily. What's it like to drive, in N mode? which stiffens up the dampers to max and alters the exhaust noise, the ESP map, the throttle map and even the e-diff map, the i30N is so composed yet also so sharp, it is capable of taking just about any road you'd care to throw at it to pieces. Genuinely, it is that well sorted, that crisp and clear and precise in its responses, and in pretty much everything it does. Especially the way it steers and slows down for corners, and then just sits so sweetly in them for a second or so before taking full power once again at the exit. I also like the fact that you need to learn how to get the best out of the e-diff in order to get the best out of the car itself. And to do that it's all about having the confidence to get on the throttle as early as possible in a corner because when you do the e-diff really comes to life and, so long as you haven't got your entry speed cataclysmically wrong, the front tires bite and your exit speeds become increasingly ridiculous. In a way, the engine plays second fiddle to the chassis in the i30N but it's still an essential ingredient to the cocktail. In short, it does the job, and does it pretty well, without ever making the hairs on your neck head north at any stage. There's very little lag, the throttle response is strong and clean, and it delivers enough performance to enable the star of the show the chassis to sing. And if it had more boost in order to give it, say, 320 bhp rather than 271 then it would be even better still. But maybe that's another state of engine tune, for another car, for another day. In the present, the i30N as it stands is a pretty stunning first effort from Hyundai's N division. Inside you get all the usual stuff you'd expect from a Hyundai increasingly high quality switchgear and controls, lots of room front, rear and in the boot plus a great level of spec including a good pair of electric sports seats and all sorts of buttons and modes to play with. In total there are five different drive modes to choose from, Echo, Normal, Sport, N and N Custom, in which you can tailor all of the car's individual components to your own personal desires, which is nice. And so when you've had enough of all the exhaust pops and bangs, which are entirely natural, says Hyundai, so not at all computer generated, and the idea of wringing the car's neck in N mode has begun to lose its appeal momentarily, you really can dial it back to normal and the whole thing settles right down. The dampers still deliver quite a taut level of ride control but no longer do your fillings feel vulnerable, while the exhaust system climbs back into its box and goes to sleep for a while.
Price and rivals at £27,995 the i30N represents a lot of car for the money, especially as it's fundamentally so sharp to drive. In price terms it sits half a cog beneath the likes of the Focus R's and Civic Type R but, to drive, it's up there with the best of them. And beside a Golf GDI, with which it competes theoretically on price, it's a much more committed effort. The N car has arrived, and now. Alongside Jaguar Land Rover Classic's converted electric E-Type, Jaguar has also presented a forward-looking concept called the Future Type a vision of the brand's future mobility solutions. It centers around the unusual concept that drivers of the future might not own a car themselves, but just one component that allows them to tailor a vehicle to their own requirements in this case, taking the form of a steering wheel. Well, it's a wheel in concept but its shape might take some getting used to and whether you'll even use it for steering is dependent on how much of a journey would be completely autonomous, but effectively it works as a key through which all your automotive pursuits are directed. And it has a name, Sayre. Jaguar calls it connected, intelligent and removable, and predictably you'll spend as much time talking to it and most of the time, Sayre lives in your home. A little like a wheel-shaped iPad, it grants you membership to an on-demand service club, which allows you either sole ownership of a car, or the option of sharing a car with others in your community. You can use Sayer to summon your vehicle for example, using it to book the vehicle ahead of time if you need to get to a meeting, and connect you to the outside world, digitally rather than physically, while the car is driving. In terms of the driving itself, the car can operate autonomously for as much or as little of the journey as you desire Jaguar repeats the usual autonomous mantra that the car can drive itself on the more tedious legs of your trip and allow the driver to take over should you happen across a twisty bit of road. We're less convinced about the company's promise it will offer a dynamic, emotional experience however there still seems like a large degree of disconnection between what dynamic and emotional traits mean to people like us and what they mean to companies desperately scrabbling to remain relevant as tastes and trends change. When was the last time you felt an emotional experience with your smartphone, for instance? You might care about the brand, be it Samsung, Apple, or similar but it's more of a means to an end than an emotional purchase something you'll forget about as soon as something with more features comes along. Jaguar shows no sign of losing track of the more tactile and genuinely emotional joys of driving just yet be that the growl of a V8 or even the beauty and craftsmanship of an electric converted E-type but use of terms like dynamism and emotion for a wheeled smartphone seem rather inauthentic.